I would like to welcome you all uh, to this panel on the horizons of expectations and spaces of experience between accident, hope and trauma. I was very pleased when I read the title of the panel I have the honor to chair. Horizons of expe expectations and spaces of experiences, these historic categories, as uh, it has been already mentioned uh, before, come from the German historian Reinhard Koselek, with whom I have felt a personal connection ever since we visited the Triblinka memorial site together nearly 20 years ago. Reinhard Koselek took a rather critical view of memory, memory studies and in an article on German and Polish pasts he wrote, I quote, there is no collective memory, but there are collective conditions for possible memories. It will be fascinating to see what the panel particip participants have to say about expectations and experiences in Poland, the Ukraine, and in Russia. And um, uh, let me at first um, announce um, that um, the presentation uh, of Professor Striek will be in Polish, so it would be good if those of you who need a translation, uh, who do not understand Polish, take the headphones already now. I would like uh, to introduce the first speaker of this panel, Joachim von Puttkammer, is professor for East European history at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena and also the director of the Imre Kertes Kolleg Jena. His paper uh, will be on making sense of the unexpected, how the reshaping of the Polish power apparatus in 1989 is being remembered. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here um, and to be able to present <coughs> um, part of um, what is uh, uh, my, uh, part of my current research project uh, on the dismantlement of state security in Poland and the building of a formation of a democratic order in 1989-90. <coughs> this has um, um, <coughs> to do with memory studies in this respect um, that many of the major figures, political figures of the time um, have um, soon after they left office um, <coughs> um, given um, lengthy interviews, many of them published in book form, um, which can serve as a, um, as a way of um, shaping uh, the memory of um, their, what they had done in 1989-90. Um, <clears throat> the first ones coming out um, already in 1991, such as the, uh, the uh, <coughs> memoirs of Czesław Kiszczak, um, <coughs> previously Minister of the Interior. Um, others came out um, somewhat later, throughout the 90s, um, some of the um, <coughs> major actors I'm going to speak about even published two sets of memoirs, uh, such as Krzysztof Kozłowski or Jan Rokita. <clears throat> the intention of my paper is to use these interviews um, and memoirs um, not just as sources of um, <clears throat> what had happened at the time, I'm doing that as well, um, but mostly to demonstrate how the benefit of hindsight shaped their interpretation of the events. <clears throat> Looking at the conflicts um, which erupted in 1989-90, <clears throat> within the Mazowiecki government through the lens of memory studies, and that is already part of my argument, might offer a perspective on the emotional foundations of the new democratic order that was um, <clears throat> about to be established. I will begin with Jan Rukita, <clears throat> who might be um, considered one of the mnemonic warriors we heard about in the previous 
um, lecture. Um, <clears throat> he was one of the newly elected non-communist deputies um, to the Polish Sejm um, in uh, the summer of 1989, um, and was soon elected to, uh, to chair the commission to investigate alleged crimes committed by the Communist Ministry of the Interior. <clears throat> Half a year later, early in January 1990, he called an extraordinary session of this commission. He had only then received disturbing information that the state security service was massively destroying its operative files. As Rokita would recall later, he had then intervened directly with Prime Minister Mazowiecki. But Mazowiecki, as Rokita remembers, had played down the issue and referred him to Czesław Kiszczak, Deputy Prime Minister, and <clears throat> as um, you will know, um, next to Jaroselski, the leading figure of the old communist elite, who was then still in charge of the Ministry of the Interior. In a formal desideratum, the Commission demanded that the Ministry should declare itself on the issue and name the people who were responsible for destroying the files, and it also called on the State Prosecutor to investigate the matter. The Ministry tried to remain silent, even one week later, when even the uh, parliamentary fraction, the Obywatelski Club Parlamentari, Par Parlamentarni, supported Rukita with a request of its own. So he took to extraordinary means and went public. In a press conference on January 31st, he forced the chief archivist of the Ministry um, of the Interior to admit mass destruction of files, which, as he claimed, was in full accordance with the law. Anyhow, the next day, his superior Kishak then ordered to stop the operation. <clears throat> this is a key moment in the dismantling of the communist power apparatus in Poland. And until this very day, the mass destruction of state security files is being considered by many as one of the major shortcomings of negotiated transition and of the Mazowiecki government for not having prevented it. Had the moderate Prime Minister Mazowiecki, a Catholic, been too lenient or maybe even too merciful on the communist nomenclatura? If one looks at the timing, there is a discrepancy. <clears throat> the mass destruction of state security files became public at a moment in January 1990 when communist power was falling apart, mostly at that time by itself, but also by energetic government action. <clears throat> With the beginning of this very month of January, the state security service in Poland had been cut back by two thirds. <clears throat> it had been only moderately cut back before, but now it was seriously cut back by two thirds and totally dissolved at the local level. <clears throat> Kiszczak um, in this month had to give up all his previous political aims he had pursued um, since um, he had been reappointed Minister of the Interior by Mazowiecki in August. He had given in to the newly formed police trade unions, <coughs> which he had tried to fend off earlier. Uh, he had to give in to, um, to the <coughs> new police legislation, which the same was debating, to <coughs> which aimed at a far-reaching reform of state security and the police, then still citizens' militia. <clears throat> and he also had to concede that these reforms would include the verification, it was, as it was called at the time, verificatia, a form of lustration of former state security officials. Also, Solidarity was about to take control, now at last, of the Ministry of the Interior, <clears throat> when a few weeks later the Catholic journalist Kosłowski was installed as vice minister. And within a month, Kosłowski would succeed Kiszczak as minister after serving a, a brief term as chief of the newly established intelligence agency. I'll come back um, to all these people, just to introduce them briefly uh, right now. Most striking of all, <clears throat> the mass destruction of state security files also became public at precisely the time when the Polish Communist Party was holding its last Congress <clears throat> and dissolving itself. So therefore, the charge that the Mazowiecki government was too soft on the communist elite was actually fir first raised the very moment <clears throat> when this government was giving up its earlier position when it more or less canceled the compromise that had been scored at the round table one year earlier, and when, when it was rapidly speeding up the decommunizatia, <clears throat> which radical oppositionists had demanded since Solidarity had scored its landslide victory at the polls in the June elections of the previous year. So how to explain this discrepancy? It can be explained with reference to the political constellation. Since the elections of June 1989 and since the Mazowiecki government had been formed, much had happened on the international um, scene. <clears throat> the Berlin Wall had come down in November. <clears throat> Communist regimes had been toppled earlier in Hungary, then in the GDR, then in Czechoslovakia, and the gruesome pictures from Romania 
Nicola, Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu's corpses um, from December 1989 were still in everyone's mind. In short, one can say the entire constellation of the round table, which had set off democratic transition in Poland, <coughs> while throughout the Soviet bloc, communist power had still been intact, now was falling apart. There was no longer any need to compromise with an enemy who had obviously lost all ability to strike back. There was <coughs> no longer any need to leave communist ministers in control of the power apparatus in exchange for the loyalty to the new democratic government, or even to keep General Jaruzelski in office as president so as to keep the Soviets quiet. So all these concessions, which half a year earlier had seemed wise in the daring grasp for a first non-communist government within the Soviet bloc, <coughs> now suddenly appeared outdated. But that is only part of the story. <coughs> Given this acceleration of reform and even decommunizatia in early 1990, <coughs> it is only fair to say, is it only fair to say that the charge of having been too lenient <coughs> is a, on the communists is a backward projection? And is there any contribution to be expected to this question from political memoirs, given the rather banal insight that memoirs typically tell of their author's roles within a process presented as straightforward, coherent, and familiar, <coughs> which is serving to defend their moral standing and reputation? Memoir writers, especially political ones, with the benefit of hindsight, always know better and make sense of what at the time was yet quite unexpected. <clears throat> for these memoir writers, personal issues were at stake. This holds especially true for those people who are directly involved in dissolving the state security apparatus and reforming the police. The already mentioned Krzysztof Kozłowski, Jan Rukita, Czesław Kiszczak, um, of course the Minister of the Interior, and Prime Minister Mazowiecki. <clears throat> if one looks at their memoirs, the destruction of state security files, which I mentioned at the beginning, and the way it became public, is particularly interesting. In a striking coincidence, it is being remembered in one way or the other as an issue of loyalty or a breach of loyalty. Mazowiecki would later say in an interview that was recorded in 2004 that burning these files had been, I quote, a clear breach of loyalty. That was a direct response uh, to Kishak's earlier claim that he himself, Kishchak, certainly had not been loyal to Mazowiecki on this issue. Kishchak's argument was a bit more twisted. <clears throat> he claimed that once the issue had become public, he himself had <clears throat> told Mazowiecki that the destruction of the files was a routine procedure and fully in accordance with the law, as I mentioned. Um, he also stated that in public. <clears throat> but he adds <clears throat> um, that Kishchak, <clears throat> um, Kishchak adds, <clears throat> that burning the files was also a measure to defend former oppositionists against possible abuse and slander. Um, because it was uh, <clears throat> um, 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 the, the files on observing the Catholic clergy and the opposition, and thus one would not be able to trace their cooperation with the state security anymore. So precisely by destroying such files, the implicit argument ran, Kishchak had remained loyal to his arrangement with Wanderwetzki. Kishchak was a military person, and he valued loyalty very highly, as his memoirs show on several occasions. <clears throat> but it's not just an issue between Mazowiecki and Kishchak. The issue of loyalty also comes up in Kozłowski's memoirs, and again in relation to the state security files. Kozłowski, as um, <clears throat> I already said, um, became deputy to Kishchak um, only one month later. And at first, he seems to support Kishchak, in a cursory remark, Kozowski recalls how the generals of the ministry in general had been openly lying into his face. He had not expected otherwise. This only served to underline the deep cultural gap between him and the old guard. But Kishchak, <coughs> Kozowski recalls, had been different. He, Kozowski says, had indeed been loyal to the Mazowiecki government. I quote, everyone who cooperated closely with him speaks of his loyalty. The issue comes up in a different place, because Kozłowski claims not having been loyal to Kishchak and being proud of it. <clears throat> By his own account, he had been able, about a month after taking office, to secure the file on the death of Grzegorz Przemik, who in 1983 had been beaten to death by the police. <clears throat> Since Przemik had been the son of a prominent dissident in Poland, this case had attracted considerable attention and was still highly sensitive seven years later. <clears throat> 
The files now gave proof that Kishchak himself had at the time heavily interfered with the investigations so as to exonerate the militia and put all the blame on the paramedics who had treated the dying teenager. <clears throat> In securing these files, Kozłowski admitted to having acted behind Kishchak's, his superior's back. <clears throat> and the same goes for his order to investigate the destruction of state security files <clears throat> after he had taken office as chief of the new intelligence agency, the Office for State Protection. <clears throat> this openly admitted act of ill loyalty against his superior, his superior was somehow redeemed by the fact that according to Kozłowski, Kishchak left office with words of recognition and respect towards him. <clears throat> Only two or three dirty tricks, Schwinswa, over half a year, that was not much by the standards of the ministry. <clears throat> and finally, Jan Rokita also framed his memoirs on this issue in terms of loyalty. In a chapter titled Humble Soldier of Solidarity, he admitted that making the issue public, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, had been an act of insubordination against Prime Minister Mazowiecki. Until then, he says, such an act had been morally inconceivable. But now, in doing so, Rokita had forced Kishak to come clean, come out into the open. And this triumph, Rokita recalled, had been a bitter one for betraying Mazowiecki, loyalty to Mazowiecki. <clears throat> this overlap in framing the accounts on this one issue in terms of loyalty is quite remarkable. Even more so, so since all these memoirs abound with recalling political conflicts, but in each case, as far as I can see, <clears throat> only the destruction of state security files is being remembered as a breach of loyalty, aside from Kishchak, who asserts his loyalty, of course. So what can we learn from this <clears throat> punctual observation? I would like to highlight three aspects. Firstly, as I mentioned before, drawing public attention to the destruction of state security files marked the rupture of the political compromise between solidarity and the communists on which the Mazowiecki government had been built. This compromise had been contested within the solidarity ca camp from the very beginning, but Geremek and Mazowiecki had had their way. And now, in January 1990, when victory over the communists had been firmly secured, it seemed only natural that radicals like Rukita would now urge for a more resolute stance in cancelling the coalition <coughs> and calling for a relentless purge against the nomenclatura, even for a new constitution, even though the Polish constitution had just been remodeled one month earlier. So to Rokita, <coughs> um, <coughs> the insubordination to Prime Minister Mazowiecki, as he calls it, came as an act of emancipation from the unloved compromise that had been struck earlier. And the same goes for Kozłowski's dirty trick against Kishchak, also an act of emancipation from the constraints of compromising. Framing this as a breach of loyalty to them helped to justify why this compromise, which now began to appear somewhat fishy, had been struck in the first place. There had been a mutual agreement which the other side allegedly, that is the communists, had not kept by destroying the files. <coughs> Addressing the destruction of state security files in terms of loyalty was the first attempt either to undermine or to support the moral legitimacy of having compromised at all. And secondly, I would argue there's an emotional dimension to all this. Kozłowski and others would argue later that in the summer of 1989, it would not have been very wise to sweep the communist nomenclatura away right then. To them, it had been better to wait for the communist rule to wither away by itself and then to speed up this process of the decomposition of communist power. But there was more to this than political tactics. Sharing government responsibility with the communists and leaving both the state security service, the police and the army under their control had to be based on mutual trust. <clears throat> and this trust had been necessary so as to overcome mutual fear. <clears throat> In the wake of the June elections of 1989, fears of an imminent purge had spread throughout the communist nomenclatura as solidarity leaders such as Rokita began to debate <coughs> whether to take part in a coalition government um, and to use that as a <coughs> um, um, overcoming the totalitarian order. <coughs> At the same time, the solidarity leaders such as Geremek and Mazowiecki themselves had been well aware that they barely had enough manpower to control an intransigent, even antagonistic bureaucracy. They feared another crackdown on the opposition, just as um, on the model of martial law in 1981, 
<coughs> and even Soviet intervention in August 1989 still seemed a potential option, though already a rather unlikely one. To allay such mutual fears, solidarity leaders had therefore repeatedly reassured com Communist Party members that they would count on their expertise rather than to oust them on political grounds. The purge against the nomenclatura in, 19, in late 1989 was to be narrowly focused on those state security office and the office officials and their superiors <coughs> who had been involved in outright criminal action and political murders. And it was precisely to this effect that the commission chaired by Rukita had been set up. At that time, that was the harshest approach possible within compromise, and already this had extremely indignated Kishak. <clears throat> the charge that former oppositionists were conducting a witch hunt against this ministry was a recurrent motive of, of his political speeches um, from the very beginning of the Mazowiecki government, and it echoed throughout his memoirs. And the third point, in recalling the destruction of state security files as a breach of mutual trust, the mem memoirs addressed the core question whether the new democratic order itself was trustworthy or not. And they do so from different angles. On this issue, Kishchak's and Rukita's memoirs overlap, though they are on extremely opposite sides. They both speak of massive disappointment. Mazowiecki, on the contrary, speaks of an important but isolated issue. And it was Kozłowski who seems to have taken some pride in having tricked Kishchak. Maybe this is because he had joined the ministry only in March 1990 and bore less responsibility for the earlier compromise than the other three figures uh, I mentioned. So this allowed him to link the entire issue to the spirit of a new and fruitful beginning. And this finally gets me to a different mode in how the dismantling of the state security apparatus has been remembered, <coughs> mostly by Kozłowski himself. He later compared his period in office with, within the ministry to the task of cleaning up sewage. It was an unpleasant, dirty job, he said, but someone had to do it. There was a moral obligation. Mazowiecki had chosen him. To the Catholic journalist, the ministry was an alien world. The generals all looked alike. They were short, stocky figures with stereotypical faces. Even Kishchak must have felt quite isolated among these people, Kozłowski mused. On his first day, <clears throat> the doorkeeper actually refused to let him in since he did not recognize the civilian journalist as the new deputy minister. <clears throat> so Kozłowski kept his dis distance, banned the drinking of alcohol during work hours, and began to read his way into the internal structures of the ministry. As he recalls, he kept his distance from party infighting, and most important, he was careful not to make enemies. The best way to him to support the dissolution of the old structures was to let it happen by itself, and not to impede this dissolution by provoking any sort of resistance. I quote Kozłowski, we were in favor of evolution from the beginning, albeit an accelerated evolution, end of quote. The generals of the state security apparatus, on the other hand, joked that from now on they could be sure they would be kicked out in style. This again echoed their disappointment with the now imminent purge of the nomenclatura, which had been averted in August and September of 1989. <clears throat> this cultural gap between the new vice minister, <clears throat> later minister, um, and the generals is encapsulated most clearly in the humor with which Kozłowski recalled having installed a team of former pacifists and anarchists in high-ranking positions within the newly formed intelligence agency. Some of them, he said, actually managed to shave, comb their hair, and exchange their woolen sweaters for more formal dress. <clears throat> Along the way, he says, they actually turned into adherents of a strong state. <clears throat> Bringing new people and a new style into the power apparatus stood for democratic victory with minimal loss. Once victory was certain, the steps could be taken uh, and recalled with a smile. <clears throat> I will skip the memoirs um, for lack of time um, of one of the other um, <clears throat> key figures in this process um, <clears throat> and um, come to a conclusion. In 1991, um, the prominent former dissident and then uh, later Ministry of Social Affairs, Jacek Kuron, recalls, I quote, now everyone knows better, but at the time, before the Berlin Wall came down, before the events in Romania, before the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, we were simply at the heart of an empire whose downfall we could only hope for." End of quote. This motive of not knowing <coughs> that the entire empire, Soviet empire was coming down was echoed by Kozłowski when he argued in defense of gradual assumption of control over the power apparatus, 
<coughs> Kuron, Koswowski, and even Kishak at some place in his memoirs claimed that the political constellation had been much different before the Berlin Wall fell, and with it, the moral standards by which their actions, that is, compromising at the time, should be measured. In stressing this basic distinction between then and now, these memoirs, though highly divergent in major aspects, <coughs> took the democratic outcome of transition for granted. None of the memoirs I discussed here address the extent to which, to which both the result of the June elections and the fall of the Berlin Wall <coughs> had taken nearly everyone by surprise. They take, in a more abstract way, they take historicity as a means of moral exculpation for a compromise which, with hindsight, became increasingly difficult to justify. But once this insecurity was resolved, <coughs> at the turn of the um, December 1989, January 1990, um, <coughs> what they remember crystallized into coherent narratives. To these persons <coughs> who bore political responsibility, the turning point of events, as they recall them, was not so much the collapse of communist regi regimes among Poland's neighbors, but the insight that the earlier compromise between the solidarity people and the communist elite had been betrayed in one important respect. When compromise had been first struck at the round table and re then reformulated after the June elections, the key issue on whether to hold the communist nomenclatura responsible or whether to spare it had been only partly but not fully resolved. It is, of course, for the historian difficult to imagine how this should have been possible at the time. <clears throat> but the way the major figures remember this issue and its key element the destruction of state security files in terms of loyalty, in terms of mutual trust and disappointment, shows that there's more at stake than issues of political tactics and strategy, of opportunities taken or missed, <coughs> of accomplishments and perhaps grave mistakes in the rapid unfolding of events that were of an unpredictable and unexpected scope. <coughs> there was an emotional issue at stake, namely whether or not to trust the new democratic regime. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very inspiring uh, presentation, which showed very clearly the importance of emotions and memories. Um, the next speaker is Tomasz Striek, and he is professor in the Institute of Political Studies of the Polish Academy of Science and in the Collegium Civitas, and his presentation will be in Polish. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, I'm going to speak Polish, my mother tongue. I will try to bring you closer my point of view of a historian dealing with Eastern Europe, especially Ukraine, how I perceive 1991 in Ukrainian memory. Let me say it will be done via the prism of current events, still ongoing events as well. Let me start by saying or quoting Serhii Yekelczyk, Canadian author of A History of Ukraine, what he wrote about 1991. He wrote the following thing. In time, events so important like gaining independence are becoming part of mythology. Precisely like other nations, Ukrainians are adorning and beautifying the history of their statehood, and they've, uh, they've emphasized a long-lasting tradition of opposition movements and a large scale of mass demonstrations. So, if we think about it like that, appearance of an independent Ukraine seems to be the result of people's revolution. Even though there was an element of mass protest, and it is true, but a very important thing was a process started from the top by 
uh, failed communist ref uh, reformators. Independent Ukraine wouldn't have arisen in 1991 if it wasn't for Gorbachev, if it wasn't for the example of the Baltic republics and silent agreement between democratic opposition and national communists. This last factor explains a lot in the next 13 years of Ukrainian history. The Soviet Union and communism are now thing of the past, and but still former elites retained their position in the Ukrainian political and economic lives. So these words were written in 2004, but, but they still are pertinent. I believe they are a good characterization of Ukrainian memory of uh, events of 1991 and the whole process between 1968 namely an event in Chernobyl and the day of proclaiming independence, 24th of August 1991. And independence referendum confirming the decision of the Supreme Council, which was held on the 1st of December 1991. Let us start by saying that Ukrainians in various regions of their country participated to a large degree in other events. They may have remembered different events from that period. In Western Ukraine, participated in many manifestations, protests, marches to defend the culture, language. They also supported rebirth of the church, freedom of religion. They participated in a chain linking Kiev and Lviv. It was modeled after the Baltic Republics. It was organized to commemorate the 71st anniversary of unification of Western Ukraine and Central Ukraine, which has taken place in 1990, 1919. So the movement was really of independent nature with such a feature, with a sense of being separate and with a sense of separate ethnicity and culture. Ukrainians from Kiev and central Ukraine participated in similar events to a smaller extent, but they still may have remembered that it was in Kiev where meetings of the Supreme Council were held in Kiev, that it was the seat of the national movement of Ukraine, a democratic formation gathered here, which was for independence of Ukraine. And it was here that oh, in 1990 there was student strike which led to overthrow of Vitaly Masol, a communist uh, prime minister. So there was memory of such events connected with mass civic involvement. It was different for southern, southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine where independence of Ukraine came with the failure of the Moscow Putsch coup and where social movements, mass movements had very small support here, did not resonate well here. There were two strikes in Donbass. They were actually quite big strikes that shook the falling Soviet Union. But probably the strikes were more important for Moscow than Kiev at that time. We have to remember that in Crimea, in January 1991, there was a referendum, and 93% of respondents were for autonomy of Crimea in an Ukrainian state, which was not even independent then. But this horizon of independence was taken into account. So these memories may have been different. But I'm not trying to say that it is just if we quote a thesis that we deal with two Ukraines, two memories, two nations, two identity communities. No, I would say it is too far-fetched, it is too simplified, because we deal with the following situation. In no place on a Ukrainian map can we find this line of division that would allow to support such a thesis. There is the whole range of certain 
stages in the middle, so various regional identities, various attitudes towards Moscow, towards Russia, towards Europe, languages, memories. The first basic thesis is as follows. After 1991, the 24th of August became the day of independence and quality of the state. The state that was created in the following years was, as the Ukrainians believed, very low, very low quality. So the day of independence commemorating 1991 did not mean any breakthrough. And if it did, still it was a breakthrough and a turn for the worse, perhaps. So Ukraine evolved toward a state which was an oligarchic state even during the first term of office of Kuchma as the president in the 1990s. The power of the president depended on how he could maneuver and manipulate and uh, maneuver in this network of uh, oligarchic influences. It did not depend on his voters. It did not depend on the constitution. So assessment of the state and its quality had to have a big influence on the assessment of 1991, which was a seemingly a breakthrough year, but only seemingly perhaps. My suggestion is that we should have a closer look at what happened next until today from a perspective of a post-colonial approach because till recently I was very much against this approach. I didn't want to interpret Ukrainian events after 1991 using this theory as a historian. I will still question this approach, but there are certain arguments that perhaps we should adopt this perspective and view different events, including changing memories in Ukraine. For a historian, a relation, historically speaking, a relation between Ukraine and Russia was not like a relation between the United Kingdom and India. We know very clearly that from a point of view of Russia, including Ukraine into Tsarist Empire and then Soviet Empire, was regaining political unity and regaining unity of lands with common cultural roots. I believe it is a thesis justified from the Russian perspective. Secondly, we know that in a Russian state, in a Tsarist state, and especially Soviet state, Ukrainians could be promoted, could, could be promoted individually, they could join elites without certain barriers, they could jo join the mainstream, the core of the state, so it was not a colonial situation. Still, we can say that there is an argument that perhaps we should have this post-colonial theory approach because everything points to the fact that at some moment it prevailed. That's how Ukrainians see it. Namely, we can say that now that's an approach of the prevailing majority of Ukrainians, I would say, and it is connected with not necessarily a policy within Tsarist Empire or Soviet Empire, but it is connected with a policy of Russia towards Ukraine after 1991. The policy is like neo-imperial policy towards Ukraine, and this approach to the past of Ukrainians on the Ukrainian and Russian past is now perceived as a colonial past. That's what happened after 23 years that lasted, that passed after 1991. And the following circumstances contributed to that, apart from Russian's policy towards Ukraine, namely Ukraine did not introduce many means of transitional justice. No retributive means, no penal means, no illustration or vetting law. So it did not purify the public space from symbols of the previous regime. Of course, as Soviet symbols, not Russian symbols. Probably the Ukrainian state could not 
lead a policy like that after 1991 because it was a creation of Russian's policy, of Russia's policy. So it is another argument for adopting this prism of post-colonial theory, appearing of the state and considering it as a separate state by the Russian state, as well as borders of the state were delineated actually in the Soviet era. So if we adopt this approach, we can have a closer look at the policy of memory, which was promoted by individual presidents of Ukraine, because president has a leading role in policies of memory in Ukraine. Under Leonid Kuchma, these features of a post-colonial state were quite clear. Because such a state wants to prove their historic backgrounds towards the colonial center, so earlier beginnings, it wants to prove earlier beginnings, previous periods, of its statehood for Eastern Europe, it is relatively easy because Ukraine may refer to being the only uh, the only heir of the Kiev Rusinia. So it may. Secondly. So actually, it was mentioned under Kuchma. And the whole narration, the whole narrative on Ukrainians' history was created under Kuchma. It was also mentioned that historical Ukrainian process culminated, had its climax in 1991. So like a thousand years struggle of Ukrainian for, for Ukrainians for freedom had its climax in 1991. It was like a relay, relay race, which ended in 1991. So they had a dream for generations about independence, and it happened in 1991. And then a post-colonial state avoids being like clear, being unambiguous in assessing events which are dividing internally and which are connected with the history of the former colonizer. So under Kuchma, the main objective was integration on the grounds of common historical narrative. So they wanted to avoid clear assessment of events of the 20th century. Especially they, did want, they didn't want to assess events of the Second World War. It was typical for the time of Leonid Kuchma as a president, which was dominating was uh, rhetorics of Derzhavotvorenia, which is state-creating rhetorics. And celebrations of the 24th of August were a very important moment in a calendar of state holidays. There were many military parades demonstrating state-of-the-art military technology, uh, Kreschatik, Kiev, and other cities on Ki of uh, Ukraine on the 24th of uh, August. There were, uh, there were uh, religious celebrations, among others, in the San Sofia Cathedral. And I guess it was a holiday even more important than the day of uh, liberation, the day of victory on the 9th of May. Kuchma wanted to have the third holiday, 28th of January, sorry, 28th of June, which is the day of constitution of Ukraine, because in 1996, with huge involvement from Kuchma, the Supreme Council adopted the constitution of Ukraine, so it was another holiday which was very much promoted at that time. Apart from the strategy, okay, let me rephrase it, Viktor Yushchenko tried to remodel his strategy of identity policy under Viktor Yushchenko there were some changes. On the one hand, Ukrainian state uh, came out of a long-lasting crisis, uh, living conditions improved, certain symptoms of economic growth appeared, uh, 
It started in 2001. On the other hand, Yushchenko could see, after the Orange Revolution, a growing dominance of a dominant power of the European project. So there was an attempt to create an anti-colonial narrative. Yushchenko tried very clearly to separate a Ukrainian history from Russian history, which meant that he stopped avoiding the most sensitive events dividing Ukrainians, so the events of the 20th century. In the first part of his term of office, the only term of office for Yushchenko, his main objective was still internal reconciliation between divided memories of Ukrainians on the Second World War and Soviet era. And here there was the following situation. It is also part or in line with the post-colonial theory. The former imperial center used this situation that he was bravely entering the discussion about 1930s, 1940s and deepened its propaganda and historical policy, and they started to try to deepen the division between the Ukrainians. And we can say that according to the post-colonial theory, the former uh, colonialist is the ruler of the narrative, owns the language, owns the narrative that the former subordinate is trying to use. It was Yushchenko who tried to go outside of this old language, so propaganda was used against Ukraine. Propaganda was to emphasize internal differences and clearly delineate internal division that divided Ukrainians into two nations. Unfortunately, Yushchenko did not notice it as a trap. It was a trap of the Russian propaganda, and he fell prey to it. How he started to support very strongly one narrative, which was nationalist and anti-colonial, which led to clear heroization of Ukrainian nationalist army, support of uh, Ukrainian um, nationalist army. Roman Suhevich and Stefan Bandera were given stars of Ukrainian heroes. So he strongly supported one narrative. In such a situation, 1991 were ignored to some extent, were forgotten to some extent. I talked to Ukrainian intellectuals who were advisors of Yushchenko on uh, politics of memory. They could not understand why he did not adopt the arguments because they argued they they argued that Yushchenko should give the star of Ukrainian heroes to General Hrychorenko, Chernovil, who were dissidents, in order to appreciate the dissident movement, which truly led to changes in the 1990s and 1980s. He didn't do that because he turned out to be, um, well, he simply could not recognize the true situation, the whole context of relations with Russia. So he made a mistake of a post-colonial state. Very briefly about President Yanukovych, we know that to some extent he tried to obliterate the negative impression, negative impression in Europe connected with Yushchenko's politics of memory. He pushed to the background all the issues of history, of memory, because he decided that visa issues that may be neglected to some extent and it would pay off because it would lead to some compromises with Russia, uh, such compromises as cooperation of armament uh, industry or uh, compromises as cheaper gas. During four years of Yanukovych in office, what appeared in the foreground was the holiday of the 9th of May the holiday, the day of victory. All the military parades organized then were coordinated with Russia. And the 24th of August was rather connected with folks, festivities, without a stronger emphasis of the state position, state participation in the uh, celebration of the 24th of August. 
a certain revolutionary process started last year in Ukraine and didn't. It was not completed yet. I don't need to remind you all the events from uh, February this year that took place in Maidan. There was a revolution that means a new beginning for the Ukrainian state. I believe it is the beginning uh, in the assessment of Ukrainians and external observers. It is much deeper than uh, what happened in 1991. So here I need to say that this time, the 24th of October, sorry, 24th of August, was the time of a clash in Donbas, military clash in Donbas between Ukraine and uh, Russia. Poroshenko uh, took advantage of this holiday to organize a military parade. In this situation, he wanted to manifest the power of the Ukrainian state. And here we face a new beginning. What I mean is two processes. First of all, purification of public space from Soviet symbols. As you know, it took place to some extent in a spontaneous process in January, February 2014. Only some symbols were removed now. Uh, local administrations make decisions. Uh, to remove all these symbols altogether. It is also happening at the initiative of the Ukrainian Institute of Remembrance. And secondly, the act on purification of power. It's called the vetting law, lustration law. It is a very typical thing because it shows that there are two beginnings of independence of Ukraine, one beginning in 1991 and the other beginning in 2014. It is the only uh, vetting illustration act in this region that foresees checking not only from the point of view of somebody's estate or property, but Ukrainians are mostly interested in checking the history of activities like oppression, oppressive activities, um, whether somebody was a functionary of the regime and removed some power former functionaries, Soviet functionaries, Soviet officials, who were leaders of political organizations or KGB, um, KGB members. So as a result, Ukraine, has, Ukraine is doing as I was trying to show, is doing what it didn't do before, what it didn't do after 1991. And I would say that there is a growing social awareness, growing civic awareness of the change. Let me sum up. I would say that the 24th of August will not become a very important symbol in a collective memory of Ukrainians. These events of last year will appear in the foreground both in the state's policy and activities of various entities. I don't have time to talk about the Ukrainian Institute of Remembrance and other actors who shape the collective memory of Ukrainians. They all focus either on events of 2014 or both on events of 2014 and events of 1930s, 1940s, Ukrainian uh, uprising army war with Russia as continuation of struggle against Russia of 1940s. It is the uh, basic topic of main actors which are active in this field in Ukraine. President Poroshenko agrees with that, or accepts that, even though it may not be the most important element of his policies. Let me sum up. And let me finally say that it is the time in the history of Ukraine, the recent months, which will, of course, if all the reforms succeed, if integration with the, Europe, with the European Union succeed, and connecting safety of Ukraine with the West, if all these elements succeed, I'm not even talking about NATO membership now, but if it's if it is successful, the revolution of dignity will become still more important in the collective memory of Ukrainians. Then there will be a gradual liberation from the post-colonial discourse, 
in this situation when you depend on the language, on attempts of liberation from the former imperial center. But for that to happen finally, the change needs to take place on the other side as well. The change needs to take place in Russia. Russia should stop treating history, the recent history, as the game for retaining respect as the military empire and uh, regaining respect for President Putin in international relations. Unless Russia stops doing that, as long as you, Russia cannot do that, Ukraine will not be liberated in the post-colonial relation in which it was stuck after 1991. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here uh, from Rauf um, Garagozov, and he is senior research fellow at the Center for Strategic Studies in Baku, Azerbaijan. The title of his paper is Collapse of the Soviet Union as Cultural Trauma and Russian Collective Memory. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank <coughs> organizers for inviting me to this very interesting conference. And now I'll start my presentation, which is entitled As Collapse of the Soviet Union as Cultural Trauma and Russian Collective Memory. <coughs> uh, uh, on October 4, 2011, Moscow based daily in Izvestia published the article of Vladimir Putin, then the Russian Prime Minister, in which he called for the creation of the Eurasian Union. Putin suggested to SIS countries, former Soviet republics, to join this union uh, in order to establish a common space for economic currents and customs. He also denied proposing to recreate the Soviet Union. However, Russia's attempts to set up the project of Eurasian Union aimed at to integrate several SIS countries under, as it is assumed, of some sort of superstate formation have evoked extensive speculations uh, um, uh, among political analysts regarding Russian intentions and goals. These speculations, in accordance with uh, the realism school of thought, look mainly into political or economic aspect of the project. However, I believe that um, the Eurasian project, in some essential ways, uh, is forged by certain cultural uh, <clears throat> Searched by certain cultural and psychological phenomena, including Russian collective memory and identity. In this presentation, I will try to trace the identity of the underlying cultural and psychological sources of the Russian Eurasian project. Before dwelling on this issue, let me start with one particular episode that happened several years ago and which stimulated my thoughts on this matter. Um, <clears throat> On May uh, 12, 2010, a visa-free visa travel agreement was signed between Russia and Turkey. On the next day, I participated in a roundtable devoted to the uh, role of Russia in the Middle East, which was organized by Baku Center of Strategic Studies in collaboration with the Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, RIS. During the discussion, I asked the assembled guests, assembled guests if they found the new visa agreement remarkable, given the highly tense relations between Russia and Turkey in the past. I then asked our Russian speaker, Leonid Reshetnikov, director of the uh, Institute of Strategic Studies in Moscow, uh, could Russians remember Tsargrad? Um, uh, the question was <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, the following. Um, <clears throat> could Russian memories of numerous wars with the Ottoman Empire, wars that were often encouraged by slogan, let's liberate Tsargrad, uh, referring to Constantinople, later Istanbul, undermined the growing cooperation between Russia and Turkey. I expected uh, a formal diplomatic answer from the speaker, who, by the way, had been a high-ranking Russian intelligence officer. To my uh, surprise, the speaker's response was long. He was at pains to point out that the Russian-Turkish past did not create an obstacle to his and in his view. Finally, he said, um, who remember those words today? The majority of Russians <clears throat> do not even know what Sagard stands for. At first glance, his answer sounded rather convenient, uh, convincing. It might be that new Russian uh, generations didn't know that Sagard was a name given in medieval Russian chronicles to Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium, later renamed Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Turkey. 
Indeed, who except professional historians might remember events back in the Middle Ages? However, as more I thought on the issue, I realized that it wasn't as simple as it, as it first appeared. Uh, from memory studies, we know that there are different types of levels of memory, individual memory, as well as collective, social, and cultural memories. Some scholars also talk about deep memory. There are different interpretations of, uh, uh, of these uh, types of memory, but the general understanding is that they bear, bear qualitatively different natures that cannot be retreated as some of individual memories. Therefore, even if one imagines that we have conducted a special survey, sociological survey, and got data testifying that the majority of young Russians did not know Tsargrad. How can one be sure that this knowledge is not somehow remembered in a different way or in different contexts? So, taken from the perspective of collective memory studies, the Russian speaker's answer is not so obvious. In order to get some insights on this issue, I explore Russian collective memory in the context in greater detail. Uh, for this, I will use two uh, <clears throat> basic concepts. Uh, first, I will... Um, the concept of collective memory, and then the concept of cultural trauma. In my analysis, I will follow a particular version of collective memory developed within the framework of a social culture approach, and Jim Wert today presented basic, some basic tenets of his approach. According to this approach, historical narratives are considered to be cultural tools promoting collective remembering. Uh, certain properties of narratives affect the collective remembering in a very specific way. Uh, again, James uh, Virch identified an abstract and generalized form of narratives as one such property which underlies numerous narratives and which describes as a schematic narrative template. Uh, <clears throat> so these templates differ from one cultural setting to another, require special reflection to be identified, and are used to mold stories about key historical events, even in cases where historical events do not fit certain models. Based on these theoretical premises, I uh, look into Russian cultural memory. Uh, my method would be the following. I, <clears throat> I look into Russian cultural memory through the analysis of Russian historical narratives as specific type of mnemonic devices and cultural tools promoting uh, identity, uh, uh, promoting collective memory. Another category which I use in my uh, <clears throat> analysis is the notion of cultural trauma, which is interconnected in some essential ways with uh, the uh, notion of, uh, <clears throat> of collective memory, with, with collective me remembering. The notion of cultural trauma should be distinguished from psychological trauma uh, in some essential ways. If psychological trauma refers to the immediate experience of, by individual of a distressing or life-threatening event, Cultural trauma is experienced in a group irrespective of being an immediate witness or victim of anarch violence. Uh, more precisely, psychological trauma is experienced if there is a direct threat to the physical existence of the individual, while cultural or collective trauma may occur if community members experience a threat to their collective identity. And here are some uh, stations from uh, Neil Smelzer, a uh, <coughs> well-known sociologist who put it in the following way, a cultural trauma refers to an invasive and overwhelming event that is believed to undermine or overwhelm one or several essential ingredients of a culture or the culture as a whole. Uh, unlike, uh, psych uh, unlike psychological trauma, which is diagnosed by psychiatrists or, psychiatrists or psychologists, cultural trauma is often determined or established by cultural, religious, or social, or political figures. Again, as Smelser put it, uh, a claim of traumatic cultural damage um, must be established by deliberate efforts on part of the cultural careers, cultural specialists such as priests, politicians, intellectuals, journalists, entrepreneurs, and leaders of social movements. Cultural trauma also differs uh, from psychological trauma in terms of the mechanisms and possible effects and outcomes. Uh, uh, the mechanisms associated with psychological trauma are the intrapsychic dynamics of defense, adaptation, coping, and working through. The mechanisms at the cultural level are mainly those of social agents and contending groups. Again, someone else put it this way. State otherwise, um, if psychological trauma operates on an individual level and deals with mostly with psychological processes inside the mental life of an individual, cultural trauma affects groups, their cultural memory, group identity, and worldview of ide or ideology. And uh, one possible way of dealing with cultural trauma could be identified as performing acts of collective remembering for rebuilding an appropriate identity. Another option comes in the rediscovering or emergence of new ideology in a traumatized community. In brief, 
<clears throat> cultural trauma that is perceived as a disastrous threat to collective identity can play a particular role in generating new ideologies, collective memory, and identity constructions. Keeping in mind these postulates, let us turn to a historical episode that happened in, four, in 1453 in Minor Asia, which had great traumatic impact on the Russian mind. Uh, Tsargrad, <clears throat> Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium, was a sacred place for many Russians from which they received their Orthodox Christianity. When the Turks captured Constantinople in 1453, it was perceived by Russians as a terrible disaster. Within the cultural trauma paradigm, the fall of Constantinople can be identified as a Russian cultural trauma. To support this thesis, I suggest the following arguments. Among various identifications that Russians might have at that time, one of the most or the most salient for them was their Orthodox identity. Therefore, they would definitely perceive the fall of Tsargrad as a threat to this formation. Soon after the fall of Tsargrad, Russian clergy responded to this event by creating the ideology of Moscow, <clears throat> the third Rome. The notion postulated that Constantinople was the second Rome and Moscow the third, allowed for a new identity as a God-chosen Russian people. These activities on the part of Russian clergy fit well into, uh, into what cultural trauma literature describes as a strategy of coping. And third, the fall of Tsargad was actually remembered through creation um, and production of different narratives. There is a list of some of them which were created uh, soon after the, this happened. <clears throat> Among these narratives, the most widespread was the historical tale about Tsargad, its creation and capture uh, by Turks in 1453, attributed to uh, Nestor Iskander or Iskinder. This tale was reproduced in several historical narratives uh, through the 16th to the 18th centuries, which in turn were republished numerous times until the beginning of the 19th century. Due to its popularity, and it is plausible to assume that novel's strong influence on Russian worldview and collective memory. It therefore seems reasonable to dwell on this novel a little bit, a little more. Um, I <clears throat> This tale, which is said to have been created in the 15th century, but is preserved in copies of not earlier than 16th century, begins with a story about the creation of Constantinople. Uh, then goes to detailed description of, of the siege and capture of the city by the Turks, and ends with a prophecy about the fate of Constantinople. The prophecy has two parts. The first part speaks about the inevitability of the destruction of Tsargrad. The second announces that Tsargrad will be liberated from Muslims by a fair-haired king. This prediction about the liberators of Tsargrad in due course has been interpreted in a sense that the fair-haired king are Russians who will defeat the Turks. Though the factual accuracy of details given in the tale testifies that its historical basis is written by a witness and participant of the siege of Constantinople, the story is already a new literary elaboration which whose author undoubtedly is Russian from the epoch when a concept about Moscow as successor of Tsargrad and its future liberator from Turkish power is being created. This is uh, the concept <coughs> of Moscow, the third Rome, which was certainly an imperial concept, However, two points uh, brought about important correctiveness to this seemingly perfect imperial idea. First, uh, <clears throat> the idea of Moscow as a successor and here um, for the legacy of Constantinople, and second, from the very beginning, the concept was covered by a specific type of victim of sacrificial narratives reproduced in a genre lament about the fallen world seat of Tsargrad. This conjunction between the two ideas of succession with the victim, with victim narratives would have resulted in meaning transformation. Uh, on the one hand, the idea of Moscow as a successor and heir for the legacy of Constantinople promoted a very specific understanding of the conquest. Within this concept, the conquest, the conquest could, could be interpreted and perceived as taking back possessions that were inherited from Byzantium by the right of successor of Constantinople. On the other hand, victim narratives, as we know from conflict psychology literature, can block the empathy and recognition of the opposite side's suffering, status, and rights. The combination of these two elements would have resulted in a particular type of interpretation and or perception of annexation and conquest by Russia. In what follows further, I will give you some examples uh, <clears throat> of interpretations presented in major Russian historical and artistic narratives devoted to Russian military campaigns from the 16th to the 20th century, which reframe annexation and conquest as liberation, as a triumph over, as ex triumph over alien force or expulsion of foreign enemies, as Jim put it, and as sac Russian sacrifice. Uh, 
Let me start with Conquest as Liberation <coughs> framing. Uh, the tale of the history of Kazan, uh, Kazanska Historia, <coughs> created in the second half of the 16th century, is a good illustration for the Conquest as Liberation framing. This tale is a literary story of the three century history of Russian Tatar relations from the time the Golden, the Golden Horde was formed up to 1552, the year Ivan the Terrible conquered the Kazan Khanate, a branch of the Horde that dated to the mid 15th century. In fact, this is one of the first, if not the very first, historical narrative dedicated to the aggressive campaigns of the new Moscow state. The tale of the history of Kazan is structured against the backdrop of Nestor Iskander's story of the capture of Tsargrad, as well as lament on the destruction of Tsargrad. Any historical point in the tale is interpreted both as parallel to the history of the fall of Tsargrad and thus grief about Kazan's inhabitants, and at the same time as connected with the idea of its liberation and thus the glorification of the Russians, the liberators. The destruction of Kazan is presented as a destruction of Byzantium under the blues of its enemies and the liberation of Kazan as the liberation of Byzantium from uh, the Muslims. In this way, the text presents a type of consciousness that perceives conquest not as a conquest, but rather as liberation. <coughs> uh, another example uh, uh, comes from Jim's uh, <coughs> study of uh, Soviet and post-Soviet history textbooks. And he told us today about uh, something about this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the Russian schematic uh, narrative template, which he, uh, which he <coughs> defined uh, as consisting of four uh, basic elements, an initial situation in which Russia is peaceful and in not interfering with others, trouble in which a foreign enemy wishes to attack Russia without provocation, then Russia nearly lost everything in total defeat as it suffers under the enemy's attempts to destroy it as a civilization, and then through heroism and exceptionalism against all odds and acting alone, Russia triumphs and succeeds in expelling the foreign enemy. Um, <clears throat> next, conquest as sacrifice. This kind of trope is peculiar for Russian literature devoted to the conquest of the Caucasus in the 19th century. Among the first was uh, Pushkin with his poem, The Captive of the Caucasus. The poem written in 1821 told the story of Russian aristocrats who seeing adventures set off to the seat of war on the Caucasus. Soon he finds himself captive by Caucasians, only to be released when a young maiden <coughs> experiencing strong affection towards him sets him free. Later prominent Russian poets and writers such as Vestuzhev, Marlinsky, Lermontov, Tolstoy, Tolstoy and others also broadly exploited the Caucasian captive plot in their poems and novels. Um, uh, the ubiquity of this theme, again, prompted different explanations. Uh, going according to Grant, Bruce Grant, uh, the Caucasian captive plot could, be help, could help accommodate Russians to the issue of the invasion. Uh, but in a sense, the captive plot is a perfect manifestation of the mentioned above combination of imperial idea with the Russian tradition of sacrificial or victim narratives. <clears throat> now, uh, let me turn to another historical event that happened um, at the beginning of the 20th century. The collapse of the Russian Empire <clears throat> and civil war of 1970-92 can also be considered within the cultural trauma paradigm. It is well known uh, from Russian history, this period was marked by brutal cruelties, violence, and massacres on a mass scale taking place during the fierce civil war between reds and whites. From this point of view, Russians would definitely experience a threat to their collective identities. In such troubling circumstances, a group of Russian emigre, emigre intellectuals proposed a new ideology, Eurasianism, which suggested a quite different sense of this world. The concept announced that Asia is a significant part of Russia, and Russians are mainly Asians, not Europeans. <clears throat> Nevertheless, even if Eurasianism looked like a new approach to what it means uh, to be Russian, it employed with slight modifications the old imperial idea of Moscow, uh, the third Rome. Uh, thus, um, Eurasian is stated that Mongols preserved uh, the Byzantine Empire for Russians. Now, along with the religious connections between Constantinople and Moscow, a geographic legacy passed on from Byzantium via the Mo Mongols to Moscow. <clears throat> However, Eurasianism failed to be a dominant ideology in Russian society at that time, as Moscow leadership turned instead to communism. Uh, but uh, Falling into oblivion during the Soviet period, Eurasianism surprisingly re-emerged soon after 1991. Uh, the re-emergent Eurasianism, or in some may call it neo-Eurasianism, <coughs> slightly adjusted its basic postulates to the changed historical, political, and other contexts. 
it posits that um, the collapse of a specific regime doesn't entail the collapse of the country. Any succession is destined to fail, and the new states have no choice but to revert to a unified political entity. And Russia must, by nature, be a superpower. Uh, the political analysts uh, rightly identify this movement as a restorationist, are striving to understand why a former ob obscure emigre ideology would be uh, resurrected after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. The explanations to this fact are uh, mainly in are given mainly in political terms. Without casting doubt upon these explanations, I would like to look at this phenomenon within the context of cultural trauma paradigm. Uh, it is strange that the breakdown of the Soviet Union is really discussed in terms of cultural trauma. <clears throat> Maybe one of the reasons for skipping this issue comes from widespread belief that the fall of the communist system was perceived positively by world community, including peoples of the former Soviet Union. However, even if the Soviet plan to shape a new Soviet man failed and the majority of Soviet nationalities preserved their ethnic identities. Uh, there still were people with inculcated Soviet identity, the so-called internationalists. Um, no. <clears throat> uh, and uh, <clears throat> for them, uh, they have definitely uh, experienced, for this category of population, the fall of the Soviet Union was really a disaster. They have definitely experienced a threat to their collective identity. This is especially true for some Russian intellectuals, people from military security and old line communists who felt strong disappointment constructing a nostalgical view of the past and pervasively used emotional language about how Russia had been shamed, humiliated, reduced to a second uh, rate state. It is not an accident that Russian President Putin, a former KGB officer, once called the collapse of the Soviet Union the, as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Individuals from these groups have taken an active part in reviving Eurasianism <coughs> uh, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. So, from this perspective, taken from this perspective, the emergence of neo Eurasianism can be considered in terms of cultural response to cultural trauma caused by the fall of the Soviet Union. So far, we have, exam we have observed three examples of Russian cultural response to cultural trauma caused by different events, response to the fall of Tsargrad in 1453 by creating a new ideology in Moscow, the said Rome, and a new identity construction of Russians, the God-chosen people, <clears throat> response to the fall of Russian empire in the 1970s uh, by creating the doctrine of Eurasianism which a new look, uh, with a new look at Russians as Asians, uh, response to the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 by the reemergence of near Eurasianism which asserts a common identity for former Soviet people. As one can see, this Russian cultural responses include a set of ideas regarding ideology and identity. It should be noted that if ideas regarding what it means to be Russian vary from Orthodox to Asians or even to Iranians, ideological construction remains constantly by reproducing the same imperial idea, Moscow, the third Rome, in different coverings, Eurasianism, Neo-Eurasianism, and this uh, constant ideological core, which can be regarded as sort of Russian cultural DNA, helps us to understand the imperial nature of Russian identity. In this context, we can conclude that Russian historical narratives as mnemonic devices, as cultural uh, <clears throat> tools, uh, uh, very much sustain the reconstruction of imperial idioms. These considerations also provide us with uh, insights regarding the question posited at the beginning of, the, of this uh, presentation. Do Russians remember Tsargrad? <clears throat> the answer would be formulated as following. Uh, so far as uh, imperial constructs are preserved in Russian narrative toolkit, Russians do remember Tsargrad on a collective or cultural memory level. It also means that even if new Russian generations do not remember <coughs> the Tsargrad uh, story specifically, and their imperial identity is dormant, they might be reminded and awakened one day by specific constellations of domestic and or international political events and political, cultural, religious entrepreneurs, since collective uh, memory devices provided by Nerev Toolkit are always there. Uh, so, <coughs> and, uh, as a, instead of conclusion, 
From the perspective of uh, my analysis, the issue of Russian imperial identity should be taken seriously into account. This type of imperial identity confounds Russian's quest for safe and sustainable modern Russian consciousness. In this regard, it evokes two uh, <coughs> questions, interrelated questions. How do Russians address their identity problem in the 21st century? And how much of a threat Russians will pose to the rest of Europe? So, will Russia become a multinational uh, democratic country or return to the old Soviet boundaries to be drafted by the Eurasian Union? The future of the Russian Federation and to some degree of the SIS countries depends on how the dilemmas of Russian national identity formation, <coughs> imperial, national, ethnic, or national civic will be resolved in the upcoming de uh, decades. Thank you very much. For, uh, Um, the discussant of our panel will be Patrick Kenny, and he is Professor of History and International Studies and Director of the Russian and East European Institute and of Polish Studies at Indiana University. He is very, very well known here in Warsaw in the academic milieus, and we are looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think the reason we have panels like this, you know, throwing together papers that are written by three different people, is in the hopes that when a panel works, even though the papers are written with different purposes and on different subjects and so on, they begin to resonate and provoke uh, new ideas. Um, and that is what has happened here. I think this has been a very successful panel. Um, one of the things that happens, though, uh, is that the discussant inevitably ends up seeing connections and, and resonances that uh, may not um, fit exactly with, exactly with what the paper writers had in mind. Um, but let me throw out some ideas of the way I see these papers connecting and see where this goes. Um, and let me start with my conclusion. I'd like to suggest that these papers are all about the story of disappointment. Um, disappointment is an essential part of any revolution. I think this should be quite clear. Uh, in fact, that's how you know you've had a revolution when you have disappointment. Because a revolution is utopian, it must uh, be followed by some kind of disappointment. Okay, that's, that's uh, simple enough, uh, I think uh, easily, at least I hope, easily acceptable uh, point. However, one of the things I realized in listening to these papers is that, of course, that disappointment needs to be expressed precisely by people who took part in revolutionary change. That is not an easy experience, to have to express disappointment with something that you yourself took part in and contributed to uh, in some level. In order to do so, in order to uh, express that disappointment, I suppose one could simply say, wow, what a bad idea this was. Uh, I was wrong. We were all wrong. And some, of course, go in that direction, but most people don't. I think it's quite human that, that they do not. So instead, what we see in these three papers are participants in revolutionary change trying to create entirely new realities. So that the destruction of the files was a gigantic con and a sellout, and there was great disloyalty on all sides. Um, that uh, Ukraine was actually colonized, and there were no um, oppositionists, or at least they can be pushed to the margin, or that Russia is Eurasia. Um, each of these ideas, of course they contain some truth, they're not made up out of whole cloth, but they are difficult ideas precisely because the, the, the speakers are grappling with the problem of their disappointment. Um, and each of them brings an epistemological difficulty because the new version of history uh, may be in some ways contrary to experience or and or brings further unanticipated or unexpected consequences. So on the one hand, we have narratives of disappointment, and two, we have uh, these narratives are both products of uh, and creators of narrative uh, or perhaps epistemological difficulties. So now to the papers. Um, first, I have to start with a, just a, a brief uh, anecdote. In uh, March of 1990, 
um, I was uh, researching my dissertation here in Warsaw, and when I uh, read about Krzysztof Kozłowski being appointed a minister, I, vice minister, I went to my mentor, um, uh, Professor Tomasz Szerota, and said, um, I think I should try to get into the archives. Uh, and he agreed. A few days later, I wrote a letter to uh, the ministry, and I was summoned. I was actually summoned for what turned out to be a classic interrogation. You know, two colonels, one nice, one not so nice, um, asking me questions back and forth. It's interesting that you seem to want to see these files, all these kinds of leading questions. Um, and uh, a rather unnerving experience. A few days, uh, well, I guess a week or so later, I got a letter back saying, uh, it was nice to meet you. It turns out we have no files that are of interest to you. But <laughs> during this meeting, though, they had, for some reason, taken out files to show them to me, saying, look, this is the kind of stuff we have. You won't be interested in it. And these were not classic EPEN files. These were reports, weekly reports on moods you know, among workers in, uh, uh, in 1946, 47, 48. And I had said at the time, my God, this stuff is fantastic. I could start you know, using it right away. So I called them up and berated uh, one of the uh, colonels I had spoken with, saying, you know, this is ridiculous, you showed me great material, and now you say you don't have anything, I saw it. Um, and they did let me in, which made me, I understand, the first uh, scholar, I guess, outside of the MSV itself, to use um, these files or practically any other. Um, I wish at the time that I'd known that, meanwhile, in the basement, things were or out in the woods, if we, if we believe the movie, uh, uh, the movies that uh, other files were being destroyed. Um, nonetheless, I can understand a little bit better now the, the experience uh, that I had at the time as a, as a uh, graduate student. Um, so the basic conundrum that uh, Rokita and Kozłowski and others face is the conundrum of lenience and revolution, two terms that don't really go well together. There's been a compromise, and yet it's clearly a revolutionary moment. And if it wasn't so clearly revolutionary, if people were caught up in the idea of, of, of forgiveness and handshaking and so on in the fall of 1989, indeed, in the late winter of 1990, the revolutionary aspect becomes much clearer, and this th sort of throws into harsher um, relief, the idea of lenience and, and the problem of this. And we see in this paper, um, on the one hand, uh, Kishchak, and on the other hand, Rokita and Kozłowski, uh, essentially rewriting the revolution, among other things, by um, recasting as, as uh, uh, Professor von Putkamer shows, by recasting uh, Mazowiecki's thick line as meaning something entirely new, um, Kishchak sort of creating this idea and others accepting it, um, that in one way or another, they're creating a narrative of failure, that there had been some kind of failure in 1989. Now, there are different kinds of failures. For Kishchak, it's the failure of reform that he argues has been was part of the story of the last 30 years uh, of communism. And for uh, Rokita and Kozłowski, it's a different kind of failure that they either lay at uh, Mazowiecki's feet or lay somewhere else. But in some way, there's been a failure to be tough. Uh, there's been a failure of uh, maybe of being um, consistent uh, or uh, consequential. But they need to create this thick line story that the thick line was actually about uh, forgiving uh, the, uh, the communists and, and turning, uh, turning away from evidence of their, of their crimes, even though, of course, that's not what it was all about, in order to explain the story of failure. Um, I think that this, this story, uh, as Professor von Putkamer uh, presents it, is quite straightforward. I, the one question I would ask uh, is uh, how much uh, generational assessments uh, play in here. Um, Rokita is encountering uh, the post-communist period as um, I think he was just uh, over, just under 30 at the time. Kozłowski is twice his age. The uh, people whom Kozłowski brings in, the anarchists, are in their mid-20s, uh, some of them. 
Uh, and so clearly, or I would expect that they are experiencing these stories in, in quite different ways simply because they would assess communism uh, in different ways. I'm not sure that this is essential to the paper, um, but because it's something I've thought about, I, I wondered about it as I read this paper. Uh, let me turn now to Professor uh, Striek's paper, which uh, I thought was fantastic and really interesting uh, way of looking at um, uh, Ukrainian change over uh, the last quarter century. And here the, the, um, the conundrum or the problem that Ukrainians face is the problem of repeated revolution. Right? We have a revolution in 1991, and it's really exciting, and there, there are events in the streets in, uh, in Lviv or in Kiev and other cities as well, and yet here we are doing it again 13 years later uh, in the Orange Revolution. And then, of course, a decade later, one has to once again say, well, wait a second, okay, this is a revolution, it's really exciting, we're having a wonderful time, didn't we do this before? Uh, and so, you know, why are we here again? Was that, was these past, were these past experiences a success or not? Um, uh, the paper also refers to another uh, interesting problem of regional difference. That is, uh, stories which seem quite self-evident in Western Ukraine are completely unrecognizable in uh, Southeast Ukraine and vice versa. So, how does one uh, grapple with these uh, with these problems, these conundrums, um, again by creating a narrative of uh, failure, um, which has sort of, uh, I guess, two parts to it. On the one hand, that the uh, revolution, it turns out, is a, an agreement made at the top, uh, that anything that was happening below is not relevant, and that, of course, is easier because then if, if if a revolution is made at the top, it's easier to point fingers uh, and to identify uh, blame than it is, I and mean, it's harder, obviously, for a politician to blame the people. So it's easier if you can shift the story, shift the entire narrative into a different place, um, because then you can blame those people on whom you have shifted the story. So it's kind of essential, actually, in both of these cases to create a story of uh, something created uh, on top. And secondly, and quite fascinatingly in this paper, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian politicians and uh, many Ukrainians generally come to recast their relations with Russia as a colonial story, even if that is self-evidently not uh, accurate. That, I mean, many colonial theorists, theorists post-colonial theorists have been trying to talk about the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet space as colonial, post-colonial. It doesn't work very well. You're absolutely right. Uh, but the point here is not exactly whether it's true or not, um, but whether uh, that uh, resonates uh, in some way. And, and here's what happens, that these stories, both the story of the creation on top, the revolution from above, if you will, or you know, the umova um, naguja, I just can't think of what that's going to be in English, the, well, the, the agreement above. Um, uh, and this colonial story helped to settle the problem of why revolution completely, con continually fails and why they're seen so differently from different places. They fail because somebody else created them for their own nefarious reasons, and the story is seen in different ways because of the colonial uh, dependency of Ukraine upon uh, uh, Russia. Um, and this leads finally, and this I think is the, is the, is the really fascinating innovation of this paper, uh, helps us to understand something about the Euromaidan revolution. That the Euromaidan revolution indeed, I mean it is early, but we can speculate that it uh, reaches deeper than 1991, certainly deeper than 2004, because, and I think this is a key point that will bring you back to the earlier paper, because it resonates with the new version. In other words, this new, somewhat inaccurate version of 1991 and 2004 has been created, Euromaidan is able to be a revolution, uh, both a revolutionary experience and one that can resonate with uh, this new version. Okay, uh, the um, Euromaidan is shot through with ideas of betrayal from above having, having happened over the previous two decades. 
ones that people can easily uh, see. You know, that's why they, they boo uh, Timoshenko, for example. Um, and secondly, it resonates with the idea, you know, very clearly resonates with the idea of the colonial relationship. Because insofar as that might have been more in the background in 1991 or 2004, 2014 is shot through with ideas of Putin's colonial you know, revival or attempted to revive a colonial relationship. And here has occurred to me that, that um, if you're going to create a second revolution, you want it to be able to resonate with this new narrative. And perhaps, and I'll just throw this out here, perhaps we could say that this is what the Kaczynski brother, brothers were trying to do, that insofar as 1989 could be discredited as, oh, war on top and betrayal and disloyalty and the files and the thick line and so on, well then, the Kaczynski failed revolution would have worked because it would have played off the whole idea of the Cvarta Gespospolita was that it plays off of the ideas of the, the rhetoric of the failed, quote unquote, failed revolution in 1989. Fortunately, so far, that rhetoric has not succeeded. Um, I'm ever uh, optimistic on, on that front. I might be the only one in this room, but I, I am still optimistic on that. Then we turn to uh, Dr. Garagazov's uh, paper, which has a, I just want to say this has a, a really wonderful, innovative use of framing theory to examine Russian discourse, and I think that's incredibly uh, valuable. Here we have uh, the conundrum of a revolution, 1991, that puts Russia farther back in the pack uh, internationally unlike the Russian Revolution in 1917, which one could see as, or could be cast as, you know, Russia entering the stage and becoming successful and being taken seriously finally by the world. That's how, that's how Stalin explained the revolution at least. And here's a revolution which evidently doesn't do that, that Russia slips off the table, eventually is able to claw its way into the G8, but it, everybody knows it's barely number eight uh, at that particular table. So how do you make sense of a, of a revolutionary moment that actually uh, only pushes Russia uh, farther back? Now here, uh, in what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna re recast the idea of trauma as this idea of disappointment, but still I think we agree that this is an emotional uh, story. And essentially what happens is that uh, Putin and others uh, recover the Eurasian idea um, as a way of explaining what has happened. And in here, I mean, what is wonderful is showing how this resonates so beautifully that uh, it can resonate with the idea of Moscow as a third Rome, uh, can resonate with, re uh, with these relations with uh, Turkey, um, and also resonates with this understanding of Russia's new role after uh, 1917. And so that's, the, that's the, the great success of the idea put forward by Putin and his colleagues, um, sort of recuperating, if you will, the Eurasianist idea. Now, granted, the Eurasian idea doesn't exactly work. I mean, uh, these three events, the Third Rome, the Russian Revolution, and the fall, the fall of the empire, and 1991 are quite different. One of them is motivated by an internal utopian idea. The others are not. One relates to an external factor, the fall of Constantinople. The other two are, are arguably not. Two of them are more secular events. One is not. But fine, that's Putin's problem, not ours, exactly. Um, but what is uh, fascinating here, you know, sort of tantalizing at the end, uh, and here maybe one could call for uh, one could ask for more elaboration of this idea, is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Garagalsov suggests, this um, uh, Eurasian idea, insofar as it sort of satisfies this problem, okay, we're, we're farther back uh, in the world international tables, but that's because we have a new role and another important role that we just need to embrace. Um, it nevertheless threatens Russia's future and threatens its neighbors. And in some ways it seems obvious, but I, I could wish for more explanation of this. So in conclusion, uh, all three of these ideas, while they uh, resolve the conundrums that the participants face, and they make them feel better, right? They sort of resolve this internal uh, conflict between the disappointment one feels and the participation one has uh, experienced. Um, they clearly need to, in each case, face the question of whether the unexpected consequences of these ideas, 
of hollowing out revolutionary experience, of renaming it, of putting on uh, frames that may not work or may have further consequences, and whether the consequences of these new ideas are simply too great to bear. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very, very inspiring comments. I think there was one question for Joachim von Puttkammer, this generation aspect. Uh, perhaps you could answer it shortly, and then I will open the discussion. Thank you very much uh, for, for this inspiring comment um, and the questions. Now, what I find fascinating is that the, the, um, the people I've been analyzing are beginning uh, to reframe the story as a story of failure at the moment when success is obvious. <laughs> Uh, um, except for Kishak, of course. <laughs> um, uh, and this is, um, uh, I think there's several um, aspects to this. Um, um, they're putting the, they're beginning to put the foundations of their success in doubt, the evolutionary approach, at the time when the evolutionary approach is no longer needed. Um, that is one thing. The second thing is, you mentioned it briefly, um, I didn't, um, I didn't mention it at all, is that uh, all this is uh, sort of, Getting into this um, conundrum of um, a split within the uh, uh, within the solidarity group between uh, Barbarossa and uh, Malevsky, which now becomes comes out into the open. Um, I think that is also um, quite important. Um, and still, I would say it's um, the way they they formulate this hints also at an, um, a very personal and emotional dimension. Whether well, there's a generational setting to all this, um, <coughs> I'm not so sure. Um, um, uh, Rokita is uh, the youngest uh, in the group. He is. Um, he was partly affiliated to even this anarchist um, group, which uh, um, uh, had been brought into, into the ministry somewhat later. Um, and um, he is already um, a, a prominent solidarity, a younger prominent solidarity activist um, in, in the late 1980s. Um, but there are several. Um, uh, he's not the only one. There are several people um, uh, elected to the same, who are more radical uh, than the Mazowiecki group, um, partly from the provinces. Um, and maybe the most important thing is that he's not uh, Rokita is not part of the core group of intellectuals, uh, the core group of the core, <laughs> um, <coughs> where others feared that these might be uh, taking over now, becoming a new uh, sort of government or even state, a dominating party. Um, so uh, it's worthwhile looking a bit closer, but for the moment, I would say probably it's not so much a generational aspect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So your question and comments, please. And I think uh, it would be the best way to collect four questions, comments. So please. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you for the voice. I have a short question and uh, a remark to Professor Kammer. Uh, mm, thank you for your excellent paper. Uh, you've been uh, widely discussing uh, the issue of the uh, transfer, um, transformation of the security uh, apparatus uh, or reshaping of the security apparatus in Poland during the 89-90. Um, I have a feeling, I guess you focus because of the time probably, uh, on the destruction of the files and uh, skip a little bit the issue, uh, very exciting issue um, uh, of uh, so-called verification of the former officers of the intelligence or counterintelligence uh, service or security service. Uh, is it exciting uh, um, as well because of this uh, you have mentioned in uh, uh, in the paper, uh, this um, uh, witch hunting, which uh, uh, we were afraid of at that time. Uh, I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the part of this staff, of those officers, uh, as we know, were uh, dismissed from the duty, um, but uh, there were huge 
branches, entire branches of the security apparatus which survived untouched uh, and managed to develop uh, themselves uh, within the new structures of the security apparatus during the 90s. Uh, was it not uh, also a kind of compromise? I, th that's my question. Um, what is your experience from these memories? Uh, what do you learn? Uh, how those uh, key figures uh, are regarding uh, this um, reshaping of the security apparatus? Was it a disaster for Kishchak, for example, that those so-called political uh, divisions of the security service were dismantled? Or was it a victory of him because the intelligence and counterintelligence in a huge part managed to, uh, to survive in the new state? Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, please. Adam Mielczarek, Institute of Sociology, University of Jagiellonian. I have a comment uh, to uh, Professor Putkana uh, about lack of one actor, one important actor in the history uh, you are uh, talking about. I mean, a social actor. I mean uh, that, uh, however, we cannot forget that solidarity uh, whose representatives were the government of Mazowiecki, uh, was a democratic organization which had uh, uh, structures, which had procedures, and which had program. <coughs> and uh, the question of uh, uh, responsibility, criminal responsibility of the communist services well, was uh, one of the main topics of uh, solidarity program in the 1981, uh, I mean uh, the program called Samarom Kalashpospolita, and uh, which was an uh, important topic of uh, the program of underground solidarity and so on. Uh, the representative, the, the OKP, the, the uh, Committee of Vatelskie, uh, decided not to subordinate to this former procedures of uh, solidarity, and that was a political decision that was uh, important and uh, that uh, led them to a success. But uh, what is important for me that, uh, the as you speak about responsibility, uh, the politicians like Kozłowski and uh, Rokita, uh, they can use the terms of moral responsibility but they don't take account of their, responsibility, their <coughs> democratic responsibility towards uh, their uh, background, the, the, the people that support them. Uh, and I uh, want also to mention that uh, this problem wasn't absent in the public space because uh, maybe there was no uh, political opposition, the solidarity right uh, that uh, could express it in the parliament. However, uh, there were the grassroots actions led by uh, Fighting Solidarity, uh, the actions of uh, occupations of uh, buildings of, uh, uh, par of Communist Party in, different, in many cities in uh, Poland in order to uh, preserve the documents, the historical documents. And uh, those actions were policized uh, by uh, the services of Minister Kozłowski. So that was also a problem uh, of the problem of uh, the conflict between the uh, activity of the social movement and the administration. Uh, I, I don't uh, want to uh, take a part here, but I want to stress that uh, the narrative built by those politicians, uh, those politicians excludes, uh, excludes uh, that topic, that uh, uh, they are responsibly, uh, responsible uh, for uh, their politics, they are responsible from moral point of view, 
but uh, the topic of the responsibility towards uh, the supporters is completely absent here. Joanna. Thank you so much for all these wonderful papers. I have a question, or perhaps it will be rather a comment. Uh, I was struck by, um, let's say, different epistemological perspective of uh, Professor Garagazov and Professor Fotput Kamer, but then there was something, uh, uh, something which links these two, uh, two, two papers together. But on one hand, that the Polish situation is a very short time span, just an open-ended situation, which later on is memorized and narrativized in, in different ways. Then we have this very long, long story of Russian cultural memory and Russian cultural templates, which uh, ends up in, uh, in kind of redefining the, the failure const constantly. I was just thinking if we kind of uh, put that perspective also to the uh, paper of Professor von Putkamer, wouldn't be, not be an explaining factor why Rokita, for instance, explains the, uh, that what happened as a failure. For instance, there is this long-lasting uh, cultural template in the Polish discourse of a betrayal uh, since the 18th century, let's say, of a betrayal of a, uh, of a politician to some of the foreign and uh, alien sorts. So that maybe there is, there is another more hidden layer of these memoirs of the kind of cultural tools which they use, which, are, which do not directly refer to the situation they, uh, they just experience, but the, that's the way they are kind of forced to narrate. Thank you. Yes, please. One more. University of Antwerp, uh, Brussels University. Uh, first question I have to Dr. Gargazov. Um, what do you think, uh, how current Russian-Ukrainian conflicts influence on collective memory in Azerbaijan? Does it change to somehow uh, perception of uh, Soviet heritage? And another question to Professor Kenney. You mentioned very interesting points uh, the base for Euromaidan in Ukraine. But uh, don't you think that in some sense it's uh, kind of a result of postponed uh, transformation in Ukraine? And actually, uh, those events, it was kind of end of post-Soviet Ukraine. And first of all, on the symbolic level. Okay. okay. Uh, there was another question, and I think we could include it. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a short question to Pan Striek. Just, uh, I, I think uh, I missed uh, uh, an interesting part. M maybe me misunderstanding. Uh, you said uh, something that um, the post-colonial discourse was or perceived to be a trap by uh, Russia. This uh, sentence uh, wasn't so clear to me about uh, being a trap of a Russian trap. So if you could explain that. Okay. So I think who will start? Yeah. You will start. I can start. Thank you for these questions. Now, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I expected this to uh, turn a little bit out to what actually happened in uh, destroying the files and, and how this was addressed and how the, these processes uh, came about. And I should maybe um, come to your question first on, on the grassroots movement. Now, <clears throat> after Solidarity had scored its victory in, um, in the June elections, in the second session of the same, you have the first interpolations, and immediately people come up with these issues. Um, <clears throat> crimes committed uh, by the Soviets, crimes committed um, by, uh, uh, by the Polish state security, um, militia violence, excessive police violence against um, <clears throat> um, demonstrators from the from the right, from the uh, Confederacja. Okay. And um, and then one deputy stands up uh, and says, and by the way, there is um, this ministry um, is charged with 100 political murders. Um, basically priests, oppositionists, and others. And we have this list which we prepared for the Helsinki Committee um, 
And another, an earlier vice minister um, comes up and, and says, oh no, this is, uh, prove it if you can. <laughs> and <coughs> what they do is uh, they set up an, uh, a commission, this, the, the Rokita Commission. Before the, uh, the government, the Mazarinsky government is being formed um, on the 2nd of August, uh, 1989. So what happens is in forming, in the process of forming this government, um, they're channeling this um, <coughs> um, unrest um, among the grassroots into forming this uh, commission, which is to investigate these things. And with Rokita as his chairman, um, who is a very prominent uh, anti-communist at the time, because he's one of the, I think, the only person who ever managed uh, be, uh, in the 1980s uh, to charge a state security uh, official um, in, uh, in process before, uh, to drag him before court. And, um, <clears throat> and Kishak, as I, as I said, um, he, he's um, absolutely uh, angry. <laughs> uh, this is something he, he, he finds very, very difficult uh, to accept. Um, and still, this commission happens, um, and there's even communist uh, deputies on the commission. And uh, I looked at, at the, uh, uh, the minutes of the commission, and they're beginning to work together and, 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 and structure the process they're doing. And they say, we have to trust. There's one uh, um, situation where the communist deputy tells Rokita, we have to trust each other in this commission. This is, so this is part of the entire compromise um, being built. And you're um, <coughs> indeed right at, um, at that time, uh, or maybe, maybe I should add, um, it is this very time that the state security dissolves um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the departments which are observing the priests uh, and the oppositionists. And it's at that time that they start destroying the files. They start in, in, in August, September um, <coughs> doing this with the argument, if we don't observe them anymore, we can't, there's no further need um, to keep the operative files. Right? Not the sort of files, reports, here <laughs> you have been looking at uh, six months later. Um, and Rokita later on recognizes this and says, they did this because we started investigating. Um, and maybe we should hold them legally responsible for obstructing the same commission, um, which is somewhat tricky because they were not asking for state security but for the prosecutor's files, but that's a, that's a detail. And at the same time, you write these grassroots peoples come up, um, and Kishak, uh, it's still Kishak um, in charge of the ministry, that is in, in, in the fall of um, uh, October, November, when they start um, occupying um, a party, and more party than um, state security or police um, offices. But the issue of the files is not really raised. It is uh, raised only um, in public, um, not by this grassroots movement, um, uh, but it's raised in public at the time when it's raised um, um, in East Germany, forming, or collapsing East Germany. It's raised on the, um, within days of, of, uh, of a scandal erupting in Hungary, um, but mostly it is, um, it is coming up because um, at, at one moment the Rokita Commission says we need this file um, because there's an alleged murder, murder plot against the priest and we want to see the file. And then he gets the answer, oh, we destroyed it. <laughs> and then all this comes up, and then suddenly all these other reports also come in um, um, with mass um, operations. I mean, these are secret operations by the still operating uh, police, uh, transporting large numbers of files uh, to ovens where they're burnt in masses, uh, destroying the institutional memory <laughs> of, of, um, of part of the institutions. Um, <clears throat> So now one can, um, with hindsight, one can of course say that is um, one success Kishak, that was um, the first question, um, might have scored, but that is nothing he ever stated in public. If you look at, uh, or <coughs> as a goal, if you look at what he says in, uh, in September and October, both to Mad uh, Mazowiecki, but mainly to his own leadership, um, he comes up um, with saying, what I want um, is a very moderate, um, <coughs> um, reform. Um, I want um, my state security people to be transferred to the police, to, to the militia. There shall be no verification at all. There must be no trade unions, and especially police and um, state security must be kept as together. There's two services, but they share technical services and, so on, uh, and social services. All this must be kept together. Um, and you can see quickly that from November 1989 onwards, um, when events in Poland begin to spread to the neighbors, um, he has to recede on every single one of, this, of these um, uh, aims. So it is very difficult to say um, that he scored any hidden victory in securing a future um, to his people. The, um, 
the trade union people, the police, newly formed police trade union people, they come in um, from January, February 1990 onwards, and with the uh, incorporation with Kozlowski, Kozlowski and others, uh, they're beginning uh, to purge the police, saying, uh, and these people have to have to leave. They're stopping the transfer of state security people into um, the police. Um, <coughs> And they begin this um, um, uh, process of uh, verification, um, which takes place um, um, in the summer of 1990. Um, there had been, they go back all the way um, to, uh, to 1989, say who has been state security official then, not now, but then, uh, 24,000 people. Um, about uh, 13,000 of these are kicked out. Um, another, um, <coughs> uh, 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 undergo verification, I'm sorry. Um, and about 9,000 of these um, are kicked out. And those who do not undergo verification um, uh, go into pension or don't apply for verification, the, the high ranking officials and so on. So it's about 5,000, 6,000 former, you could say 20% of the state security um, people who actually um, get a chance to apply to be uh, uh, employed in the, uh, in the service. Um, and even among those, um, as Rokita recall, himself recalls later, um, even among those who, um, <coughs> um, single ones are being singled out and people come up after the verification process and say, um, oh no, um, we have a story, this person and myself, and he has to go. He's discredited. And it, uh, many times that um, uh, is actually um, being done. Whether there's a long-lasting template in the... Um, um, I think not so much, <laughs> um, because uh, to Rokita this is a, also a twisted story. He's heading this commission. He has communists in it. He, at some moment, recognizes that he fails to address the question of uh, security, uh, state security fights early enough. He addresses it at the time when it comes to <coughs> um, when it becomes uh, obvious to him. Uh, but then it's already, for much, it's already too late. Um, <coughs> then he has people from further from the right. Uh, in the summer of 1990, um, there's a TV interview with a, um, a, a, a politician, Antony Macierewicz, who says this commission is working very slowly and they're um, um, <coughs> um, precluding any persecution of people. Um, and indeed, it is working slowly, but for different reasons. And Rukita comes up and says, oh no, certainly not. <laughs> and um, I will charge you, I will drag you to court for slandering the same commission. Um, so this is where um, political infighting um, <coughs> begins to become, become rather dirty. It's the high time of the um, um, struggle at the top. Um, <coughs> and it's only then with hindsight that he's um, getting more and more radical. I mean, he's, he's been a radical anti-communist anti um, before, but it's only in the, um, in the later report, which is then uh, which comes out in 1991 and has been published um, in uh, 2005, that he comes up with these things um, <coughs> that uh, he had tried much earlier, but Masavetsky allegedly blocked him, um, and um, that the entire commission was a one-man operation, and he did what he could. Uh, and, um. Okay. Um, Dr. Ah, okay. <coughs> To respond to the first two questions, uh, our moderator, uh, you. <coughs> well, the, the, I mean, as I understand your question, how seriously we should take uh, the Putin's doctrine of Eurasianism. Uh, I will be short. Uh, first of all, Ukrainian events are the best example of how seriously it could be uh, in terms of uh, political and uh, military violence. But generally speaking, uh, uh, the problem is not uh, with uh, the Eurasian, Eurasianism as a concept itself. Uh, I think that the danger comes from, the threat comes from the Russian imperial <coughs> uh, identity and uh, collective memory constructions. And uh, so, in this sense, Eurasianism is a kind of, uh, a kind of um, <coughs> cultural tool. <laughs> But uh, from the other side, uh, as, as far as, uh, as we know now, uh, for example, uh, Putin uh, did some uh, institutional advances in, in trying to, um, to, uh, to create this uh, Eurasian Union. And actually now they have uh, 
<coughs> four members, uh, Russia, Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, and Armenia uh, in this uh, union. And uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, Moscow uh, pushing other, some other <coughs> uh, countries, uh, independent states. Uh, uh, for, uh, for example, they have enormous pressure on Azerbaijan now, uh, trying to <coughs> push us. <coughs> uh, uh, probably it will be a fail, but anyway, they are doing this, this kind of <coughs> pressure. Uh, so, so Putin's problem, it's not a Putin's problem, it might be a problem for all of us <laughs> in the future, so I don't know. Let's see. Um, regarding um, the question about <coughs> how Russian-Ukrainian events uh, impact, uh, made the impact on Azerbaijani collective memory, uh, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, and uh, I would say in, uh, that uh, actually it reminded many Azerbaijanis about the events that happened after the breakdown of the Soviet Union in Azerbaijan. In 1991 and 1993, we had uh, the same kind of event. It's kind of deja vu events, which Azerbaijans, many Azerbaijans believe happened with them at that time when uh, uh, Russia, if not created, but supported definitely Armenian separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh. So they send the military instructors, they send the weaponry, uh, money at the time. So uh, in this sense, uh, people, when they uh, listened and heard about events in Ukraine now, they say, oh, we, we have experienced this, all these type of things in 1991, 1993. So in this sense, it's kind of the uh, reactivation of Azerbaijani collective memory about the Russian invasion or Russian uh, politics in the South Caucasus. Let me begin by saying, let me begin by saying thank you for all the remarks from Professor Kenney. In a nutshell, the most important remark to me was the remark about failed revolutions and how narratives change and how following political projects may take advantage of changing narratives. This comparison with the project of the Fourth Republic of Poland, the project of the Kaczynski brothers, yes, it was the most intriguing remark to me. I would like to continue that remark. And let me say that there was a moment in 2005 and 2010 when President Kaczynski, one Kaczynski, well, Kaczynski was the president in Poland, Yushchenko was the president in Ukraine, and you may remember the cooperation between them, which was getting closer and closer. It was the cooperation between policies of memory which were becoming anti-Soviet. So Yushchenko's project was becoming similar to the project of the Fourth Republic of Poland. And, uh, it was inspired by Kaczynski's project, connected with deep removal of all the things that took place after 1989. In Ukrainian situation, this negative approach of the result, negative assessment of the result of the several years after 1989 is more justified than in Poland, but still it wouldn't be fully fair. So this policy was treated as hurting and harmful by some Ukrainians. And some Poles rejected the project of the Fourth Republic of Poland, or the majority of Poles rejected this project. So the transborder policy of memory and such influences may have appeared, but Yushchenko was rejected radically during the next elections because he received like 5% of votes. So. This level of rejection was much bigger than in Poland, the level of rejection of the government by Kaczynski. So it was much more severe in Ukraine. What you've said about the end of post-Soviet Ukraine 2014, yes, it is, unless deep up. It is the end if deep changes take place, because they are happening now in a symbolic layer. So the post-Soviet era is ending now in 2014, undoubtedly. 
post-communism ended in Central Europe at one point, there might be a debate when exactly, but perhaps 10 years earlier, 2004 at the latest, when the countries of the Central Europe entered the European Union and in Ukraine it is ending right now. It is this historical shift, but of course some problems remain. Problem of oligarchs in Ukrainian politics, it is not solved by the revolution in any sense. The problem of the second bottom, so to say, of the background of politics beside the official level. It is a huge challenge that Ukrainians are now facing, so it is not the end of the post-Soviet era for them in that sense, because oligarchs are the product of the post-Soviet era, so this product, sorry, this problem is still open, but they have deep changes of narratives, awareness, memory. It is a precondition for deep changes, finally. Because you've asked about my thesis, if I understand you correctly, my thesis connect with po post-colonial theory, my thesis was as follows. Ukrainians started to perceive themselves as victims of colonialism of the Russian and Soviet empire only after 1991, and very clearly only in recent times due to Putin's policy and due to his neo-imperial attitude towards Ukraine. I can also say how Russians perceive it. Because as I understand you, you have certain doubts how Russians perceive it, whether Russians reject such an interpretation that Tsarist Russia or Soviet Union was a colonial empire. So they reject it and they explain it in the following way. Let me refer to Alexei Miller, a well-known Russian historian, who says the following thing. Actually, uh, in the past, the Tsarist Russia was a state that can be compared with France, Spain, or so, relations between Petersburg or Kiev or other European parts of Russia can be compared with relations between Paris and Provence, Paris and Brittany, or London and Scotland or Wales. And he says, Miller says, that there was a project of a huge Russian nation back then in the 19th century in the Tsarist Russia, as there was a project of the French nation carried out in the 19th century in France. And the project failed. So there was no assimilation. There was no removal of all the differences, like regional linguistic differences. There was no integration of the Russian nation because the Tsarist Russia was too weak in terms of the civilization. And it was the only reason France on, or Great Britain were more effective in terms of civilization, like the school, education, army, possibilities of nationalization, of influence. In Great Britain, as we know, they fail as well. We could see it after the recent Scotland's referendum. It was a strong a strong voice for independence, even though the majority did not vote for independence, but still it was a, a strong argument. It failed in Russia because Russia had weaker civilizational resources. If it didn't, it would have succeeded, perhaps. You can see for Russian historians, I'm not talking about pro-Putin historian. I'm talking not about the historian representing the circles of power, because there are such historians, that's, that's obvious, but I'm not talk, talking about such a case. It is an eminent historian well known in Europe, and his interpretation is as follows. It was not a colonial empire. It was an attempt of building a nation state, a Ukrainian project, 
exceeded this point of change at the beginning of the 20th century when Bolsheviks entered uh, to power, they had to agree that the Ukrainian nation, the Ukrainian project existed. So they created the Ukrainian Republic, uh, they acknowledged a separate Ukrainian nation, and then the, the Soviet Union was not an empire, it didn't colonize. So it is the perception of very eminent Russian historians nowadays. So it is their perspective. It is not very strongly connected with historical propaganda promoted by the regime. So that's all from me. Thank you. Okay. So it's late and dinner is already waiting for us in the neighboring room. Thank you very much for your inspiring presentations. Thank you for your questions, your comment, and have a nice evening.